It's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Professor William Nazaroff. He is the Daniel Tellup Distinguished Professor at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, let's see, Bill's research focuses on physical science and engineering aspects of air pollution in indoor environments on advancing our understanding of source receptor relationships in outdoor environments. I think we're, uh, many of us are very pleased to see that he's also working recently, more recently in the biological aerosol um, regime, or area, and we're all pretty excited to hear um, his comments and insights about this area. Please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Nazaroff. Thank you. So good morning. The, um, sounds like the sound quality is about right, or at least the projection level. The, uh, I first want to acknowledge that the financial support for preparing this lecture uh, comes from two sources, the Singapore government, I'm working with them through a program called Simberbest, and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. And the talk will focus on three overlapping domains, the built environment, the human, and the microbes that we live with. Let's begin with uh, a little perspective on what I mean to share with you on indoor bioaerosol dynamics. So let's uh, start with this quote. In our daily lives, we humans move through a sea of microbial life that is seldom perceived except in the context of potential disease and decay. Indoor air typically has approximately 10 to the sixth bacteria per cubic meter. Municipal tap water may contain at least uh, 10 million bacteria per liter. Little is known about the nature of these microbial populations. With indoor bioaerosol dynamics, what we are seeking is to contribute to an understanding of this system, not just for bacteria, but for fungi and viruses as well, that is mechanistic, that is quantitative, that focuses on a description of the processes and outcomes regarding the microbiology of the built environment, centering on what is, was, or will be airborne. The talk can't cover everything in this space, so let's bound it a little bit. I would like to share with you some insight about viruses, bacteria, and fungi and also about chemical analytes that belong to those microorganisms. So that would include endotoxin, glucans, et cetera. But we will not be talking in this lecture about pollen, pet, or pest allergens. We're going to emphasize the human bioaerosol nexus, and we're going to be thinking about ordinary indoor environments, not mold-damaged buildings, not extraordinary spaces, but the common spaces that we occupy. The approach is to adapt and apply concepts from indoor aerosol science. So we'll use material balance as a core principle. Stuff is conserved. If you can account for all the things that add it and remove it, you can figure out where it's coming from and going to. Particle size is a primary determinant of the behavior of particles indoors, including bioaerosols. We seek a mechanistic understanding, and the reason we seek a mechanistic understanding is because it provides power to extrapolate from bits of evidence. And we seek a quantitative understanding because the amount of information is phenomenal, especially as we emerge with sequencing technology. And yet, some of that matters a lot, and others, not so much. We need tools to sift that which is important from the non-consequential, and that means we have to be quantitative. It's a 30-minute lecture. I don't have time to uh, develop a lot of the details, but I want to set up a simple conceptual environment that we'll use to guide our thinking of various processes. Single, well-mixed space. Okay, we can acknowledge at the beginning that well-mixed isn't the full story, and I'll allude to some of the limitations there. Single well-mixed space, air flows in, in this depiction through three channels, either mechanically supplied at a flow rate QS through a filter that has some efficiency, or leaking into the building at a flow rate QL with some penetration probability of the particles that are in that air, or flowing as natural ventilation through open windows where the penetration will be complete. 
the air is balanced, the buildings aren't inflating or deflating over time, so the sum of the flows in must equal the sum of the flows out. There's a kind of a subtle question about whether if the temperature changes, we should, or how we accommodate that. If we think about the number of moles of air coming in per time and leaving, those are very nearly equal through these flow paths. We may have recirculating flow through a filter, so that's depicted down in the bottom. We're interested in the indoor concentration, C sub i, and how it relates to these parameters, including the outdoor concentration, C naught. And among the factors that influence things are the rate of emissions from an indoor source and the deposition, which is schematically represented here with the symbol beta of the material onto indoor surfaces. We can run a time-dependent analysis for this system to a decent approximation, the steady state or long-term time averaged equation describes the balance between the supply terms and the rates of removal. And the supply terms depicted in the numerator of this equation are the sum of what is emitted indoors, E, and what is brought in from outdoors, which is proportional to the outdoor concentration, C naught. The size of those two terms relative to one another governs whether outdoors or indoor sources are the primary contributor to indoor abundance. In the denominator, we have the sum of two rates of removal, or actually three clustered rates of removal. One is the active air cleaning that we may do. The second one is deposition onto the indoor surfaces. The third one is removal by ventilation. Which of these is the largest will control predominantly the fate of the particular particles. And we can modify this, and seeing Ed here, to incorporate something like a disinfection process or a, a germicidal irradiation as another decay term. The, the, this isn't intended to represent all conditions, but it's a decent framework for talking about processes for the purposes of this lecture. Particle size, C key determinant. The bigger particles among the bioaerosols are principally governed by settling and inertial processes in air. The smaller particles among the bioaerosols don't settle rapidly, they don't have a lot of inertial movement, and their behavior in air is governed by other sorts of processes, Brownian diffusion, turbophoresis, uh, thermophoresis, diffusiophoresis, and some other things that we won't get into the details of. Most, the evidence in the literature suggests that most bioaerosol material is in, contained in particles in the size range from 0.1 micrometers to about 10 micrometers. There's material that's larger, like the projectile droplets of coughing and sneezing, that doesn't remain airborne for very long. There is some evidence of material that's even a bit smaller, but most of the evidence suggests that most of the material that we find airborne is in the range 0.1 to 10 micrometers. So we'll focus on that range. Two orders of magnitude in diameter means six orders of magnitude in particle mass, and so you shouldn't expect the animals at the bigger end of this size range to be like those at the smaller end. It's also important to keep in mind that the size of organisms, if we're talking about a viral particle or a bacterial or fungal particle, isn't necessarily the same as the size of the particle that it is associated with in the air. So we may have agglomeration or the attachment of a viral particle to some sputum, making it much larger. We may be interested in fragments of fungi or bacteria that could be smaller than the parent organism. Another quote I like, culture-based techniques essentially select for laboratory weeds, species that flourish under the typical nutritional and physiological conditions that are used by diagnostic microbiology laboratories. These are not necessarily the most abundant or influential organisms in the community. This is not a theoretical science. We need empirical evidence to support what we're doing, and that means we're limited by measurement technologies and measurement capabilities. I list here a suite of measurement tools that are applied for bioaerosol studies. Culture-based analysis, microscopy, which is long-standing but much more expensive than culture-based techniques generally. Quantitative PCR emerging as a powerful tool. We don't have a long history with it. Then there's a series of technologies that are available for measuring components of organisms, 
And sometimes these components are of interest because they are suspected or believed to have health consequences. Sometimes they're of interest because they become markers or they serve as markers of community presence. We'll talk a little bit also, or I'll show you some results of a, a new fluorescence-based technique which has the advantage of allowing real-time detection with high time resolution, something that's very difficult to achieve with any of the other methods, and that really helps us understand the dynamics of this system. One of the really important points to recognize is that culture-based methods provide a little peephole into a broad landscape. They don't show us the whole landscape. So some evidence for that is contained in the data from a study done in eastern Finland where a uh, population of elementary school teachers were monitored, there were personal samples collected, and then household and workplace samples collected, and the analysis included culturable measurements of fungi and bacteria, but also microscopic evaluation. So I've plotted here from the personal samples, the data from this study, and the average ratio of the total fungi uh, collected on the filters to those that were viable was 400 times. Less than 1% of the fungi were viable. Furthermore, for the bacteria, it was also less than 1%. 130 times as many bacteria seen on the filter by microscopy as could be measured by a cultiv uh, cultivation. And it's also noteworthy that the typical cell concentration for bacteria was about 60,000 per cubic meter in this study, about 10 times higher than the number of, of spores. A study that uh, actually Jordan and I were uh, partners on, along with several uh, students and postdocs, measured the using uh, qPCR technique uh, airborne bacteria in a, an occupied classroom. We made measurements, on, it was the ordinary university classroom. We made measurements under conditions in which the classroom was occupied and then conditions in which it was not occupied. We used size selective particle filtration uh, or sampling so that we could determine the size of the particles and then we used qPCR to determine the bacterial um, concentration or abundance on the different stages of the system. And this figure shows the results with the three key points being, um, first, that the occupied compared to vacant conditions are entirely different. There's almost no bacteria there, or very low relatively when there are no humans present, but a very high concentration when the humans are present. That high concentration was about 200,000 genome copy numbers, roughly the same as the number of cells. So we're talking about tens to hundreds of thousands of cells bacterial cells in the air per cubic meter. So the humans are clearly a strong source in some manner of this airborne bacterial load. And importantly, the bacterial concentration peaked in the size range of about three to five micrometers. Considerably larger than the individual bacteria, but remember, these bacteria may be associated with our skin cells or they may be clumped together. They're not necessarily the naked organisms. Uh, an, uh, another group um, from the eastern part of the United States at Virginia Tech recently made airborne sampling measurements also using a qPCR technique with size resolution of the filtered samples looking for the flu virus. And they did this study during the 2009-2010 flu season. They collected samples in a health center, in a daycare facility, and on airplanes. And out of 16 air samples that they collected, they detected the flu virus in half, in eight of these cases. And they found that the majority of the material, the majority of the flu virus was on particles smaller than two and a half micrometers in diameter. These would, of course, persist and could be disseminated throughout an entire interior space. These results, quote from the article, provide quantitative support for the possibility of airborne transmission of influenza. And I also refer you to a couple of good review articles by Professor Tellier, the most recent one in the Journal of the Royal Society Interface from 2009, who summarized the evidence supporting the idea that influenza does have an airborne transmission route. So one of the things that we're particularly concerned about, of course, is uh, inhalation exposure and respiratory tract deposition. And I want to provide just a bit of uh, an overview or a summary of the important aspects of how particles of different size deposit when inspired. This is a bit of a complicated 
process because there are multiple transport mechanisms of interest. The larger particles don't follow the bending streamlines or they settle under the influence of gravity. The smaller particles migrate by diffusion to the walls of the tubes that are lining our respiratory tract. The respiratory tract itself starts with large airways through which the airflow is turbulent and then gradually gets down into these very tiny airways in which the airflow is laminar or while we pause in breath still. And the um, geometry of the system, of course, is quite complex. So we could conveniently define the, divi divide the respiratory tract into three zones, the head region, the tracheobronchial region, the conducting airways, and then the pulmonary region where gas exchange takes place. And if we look at a model prediction of particle deposition relative to that which is in the inspired air, the fraction of particles that deposit, as a function of particle size over the range of interest, what you observe is that in the head, it's mainly the coarse particles that are depositing, and that's by inertial impaction. And in the deeper part of the respiratory tract, the pulmonary region, where the clearance mechanisms are slow, we actually get a substantial fractional deposition, not just of 2.5 micron particles and below, but all the way up to about five or six micrometer particles. They can reach that part of the respiratory tract and deposit there. All right, let's move on. Uh, talk a little bit about um, the relationships between indoors and outdoors, the dynamic behavior, and then later the, the sources. So uh, one of the important ideas is that in ordinary indoor environments, fungi mainly come from outdoors relative to indoors as a source, and so we tend to find higher levels of fungi in the outdoor air than in the indoor air. These are uh, probability distributions from a culture-based study, but that sampled a very large number of indoor environments. And what they found was that the outdoor air had a typical um, value of fungi of about 500 colony forming units per cubic meter, whereas the central tendency indoors, the geometric mean was about a factor of six smaller. If we look at a uh, much smaller study, but one that collected several different indicators of bioaerosol with some size resolution, we can see that in this case, the measurements were made indoors and outdoors, plotted on the bars or the geometric mean values. There's some sorting according to particle size. That's the different shaded zones. And the key point that I want to indicate here is protein, which is a measure of total biological material that would be airborne. It's higher indoors than outdoors. The endotoxin, which is a bacterial marker, higher indoors than outdoors. But the glucans, which are uh, a fungal marker, are higher outdoors than indoors, and especially higher in this very coarse particle mode. If you look in the finer particles, you see a rather comparable amount outdoors and indoors. Particles are removed by filters if we have them in our mechanical ventilation system. The quality of the filter is a huge determinant. So MERV is the rating system used in the United States. And MERV 4 filter is basically worthless. And a MERV 16 filter, if you're willing to buy it, will uh, remove pretty much all of the particles from the supply air if it's properly installed. And then size is another important factor. The larger particles are removed more efficiently over the range that we're interested in than the smaller particles are. Particles that make it through a supply air filter have to travel through distribution ducts in a mechanically ventilated system. And there's some probability that those particles won't make it through the duct, and they'll deposit on the duct surfaces. So here are some results showing the predicted, but supported by experimental evidence, predicted deposition in a, a typical cent um, medium-sized mechanically ventilated building plotted as a function of particle size through the airflow ducts. And on the supply ducts, what you see is for particles supply or return smaller than about a micrometer, they essentially all penetrate and make it into the room. But particles that are in the size range from one to 10 micrometers, as the particles get larger, they're more likely to deposit on the duct surfaces. We end up with fouled interior ducts, but we end up with the possibility that later that material may resuspend and get delivered into the interior space from some sort of disturbance. We also find that the heat exchanger surfaces where the cooling is done in air-conditioned buildings, where the heating is done in heating surfaces, can uh, serve as a site for particle deposition. And again, it's a function of particle size that influences this. We get more deposition because of the importance of impaction in this process. 
on, uh, of larger particles onto these surfaces and a lesser deposition of the smaller particles. We get more deposition onto wetted surfaces and it turns out the underlying reason for that appears to be a process known as diffusiophoresis, so the migration of water to the coil to condense forces particles, too, to migrate along with them, and they condense more or, or deposit more rapidly because of that mechanism. There's an interesting thing, like if, if you have hidden mold in the wall cavity, can that have an impact on human exposure? The answer is yes, definitely. If you have cracks in the building envelope that are larger than about a micro, uh, sorry, a millimeter, particles all the way up to 10 micrometers will flow through those cracks with normal pressure differences across the building envelope with very little attenuation. The crack size has to get below a millimeter in minimum dimension before you start to get losses of particles of the size range that we're interested in passing through the system. Ventilation serves as a primordial determinant of how rapidly we remove particles from the indoor environment. Typical values in the United States are about half to one air change per hour. The span is perhaps from 0.2 to 2 per hour. Particles of the size range that we're interested are, have a significant removal process by means of deposition. The larger particles settle by gravity. Other particles can diffuse to the walls, the smaller ones. And I've drawn lines here, the red lines sort where um, the sort of lower and upper edge of the normal range of ventilation is in terms of a removal process. Plotted are the deposition rates of particles as a function of particle size for different levels of air motion. So more air motion means a little more rapid deposition onto indoor surfaces. And the point here is that for particles in the three to 10 micron size range, settling is the dominant removal process. Those particles are then available to be resuspended later. For particles in the size range 0.5 to 3, either ventilation or deposition is an, it can be important, uh, or maybe both can be important, depending on the particular details. Particles will also deposit on vertical walls, even if they're relatively large. The rate of deposition onto the walls is smaller than the rate of settling onto the floor, but not negligible. So we uh, had, have done some experiments uh, generating the data shown here which um, illustrate that even for the larger particles, you can get uh, a parameter called the deposition velocity that is high enough to lead to a non-negligible rate of accumulation of colony forming units onto walls by means of uh, uh, this transport process. In the last minutes of this talk, I want to turn the, uh, our attention to the human as um, a source and uh, an actor in this story. Uh, you, you may have heard this uh, point that came out not long ago, although there's a much older history that we are more microbial than we are human if you do it by uh, cell senses. Uh, adult man carries 10 to the 12th microbes associated with his epidermis and 10 to the 14th in his alimentary tract. The 10 to the 13th cells in his body are a distinct numerical minority of the total, being that we call of the total being that we call man. If we abandon anthropomorphism for the microbic view, we must admire the efficiency of these microbes in using man as a vehicle to further their own cause. I, I thought about changing the sexist language to human and you know, get away from the he and do the she and the he, and then I found a quote that caused me to think otherwise. Men are known to wash their hands and brush their teeth less frequently than women and are commonly perceived to have a slovenly nature. And so once I found that, I thought, well, I'll just leave it as men. We shed skin. Charlie Weschler talked about this. The skin has microbes on it. We shed microbes. In fact, the numbers are uh, rather remarkably coherent. So it's about 20 million cells per hour that come off by desquamation. And the, uh, it's been shown that that's not inconsistent with the finding I'll show you later that it's about 40 million bacterial cells per hour per person that we are emitting when we are sitting around or attending a lecture. A quote from a nice study from the 1960s, most of the bacteria dispersed into the air of hospital wards from carriers and bedding is carried on desquamated skin. We also resuspend particles. Charles Schultz got it right with pig pen. So this uh, time series plot shows part, not biological particles, just total particles. The outdoor concentration is plotted in black. The 
uh, indoor concentration is plotted in red, each of the strips represents a different size range of particles going from smaller particles at the top end to more coarse particles at the bottom. And what I want you to note is that <clears throat> for the smallest particles, the occupancy doesn't really play a significant role. The occupancy is predominantly between 9 a.m. and 13 in this uh, classroom. But as we get to larger and larger particles, there's more and more influence of the occupants being the source of the airborne particles that we see and less influence from outdoors. The thermal plume that we've heard discussed uh, earlier in this uh, week uh, should lift whatever is in the perihuman space, including the bacteria and viruses that we are shedding. And so although this talk is focusing on the well-mixed room, there is a strong emerging literature that's investigating spatial gradients of human-generated bioaerosols, considering the effects of particle size and airflow patterns. There's also this important issue of temporality. Most of our tools only allow time-integrated sampling over some period, or we just take short-term snapshots and don't try to plot out the time series. But work we're doing with an ultraviolet aerodynamic particle sizer now allows us to look at the time evolution with good resolution. And we can see that things change within, uh, with, by an order of magnitude easily within minutes, within perhaps 10 minutes. These data were collected in a university classroom, and we could see when the students came in and left between lectures, there was a sudden spike in the number of fluorescent particles, indicating a release of biological uh, particles into the air. Here's another study showing indicators that um, human occupancy is associated with higher levels. So this is just measuring in a household the airborne concentrations in the living room and then sorting from among the 10 households studied those that had more occupants from those that had fewer occupants. The more occupied case consistently had higher levels of all bioaerosol indicators. The skin is an ecosystem composed of 1.8 square meters of diverse habitats that support a wide range of microorganisms. The skin is colonized by a diverse collection of microorganisms, including bacteria, fungi, and viruses, as well as mites. Many of these microorganisms are harmless and in some cases provide vital functions that the human genome has not evolved. That's a quote. It's highly probable, this is a speculation, that there's a two-way exchange of uh, biological material, bioaerosol material, between us and the spaces that we inhabit. The extent and consequences of such exchanges, good, bad, or indifferent, we don't know. If you look on restroom surfaces, public restroom surfaces, and use gene sequencing, as was done in this study, you'll find that there's lots of evidence of human skin bacteria on those surfaces. However, these were all surfaces that people touch. So it's not clear here that there's a bioaerosol role. This may just be simply a physical contact role. We have to dig a little deeper to see the airborne part. Three minutes. How many? Three minutes? Three. OK. We have to dig a little deeper to see the bacterial part, uh, sorry, the airborne part. And this comes back to the study that uh, Jordan and I uh, participated in together. And we not only measured the airborne concentrations, but we inferred from material balance modeling what the emissions must have been from the occupants to produce what we observed. So we ended up with uh, 37 million genome copy numbers per person per hour for an occupied classroom. It was not unlike the rate at which we're shedding skin cells from the desquamation study. And we suspend fungi too. Even though we don't think we are a primary source, there's lots of fungal material that has settled onto surfaces or that's on our clothing. We shed that as we move about or we resuspend it as we move about in our daily life. This is a study from Lydia's group. Uh, when we vacuum, vacuum cleaners are good dust spreaders and uh, it includes bacterial cells. And even when we shower, we're generating uh, bioaerosol because the water contains uh, bacteria there's biofilm growing on the inner surface of the shower head. And uh, this study indicated uh, that the quantity of airborne water droplets, which presumably carry some microbes with them, was quite high in the shower stall. OK, the last minute, I just actually, let me skip this, because there's other stuff. I ran out of time. I apologize. It's sort of putting the 10 pounds of potatoes in the 5-pound sack. A uh, few things to skip about um, disease transmission because that's being covered by other speakers in this session. And I'll just sum up. I have three slides, three points each. So indoor aerosol science provides us with a good starting point for studying bioaerosol dynamics. 
Mechanistically, abiotic particles behave like biotic particles. Aerosol science has powerful tools and theories, and particle size is a primordial determinant that we need to be attentive to. People should have a central position in indoor microbiology, not only as the ones who are studying this, but as the subjects of our study. We are a major source for bacteria. Our activities influence the emissions and fates and the outcomes of concern center on the human. And let's not forget the lessons of early researchers. There's some great old literature from public health engineering that can help inform and shape our current studies, even as we have better tools. Some challenges we face, markers of exposure are really difficult. Dust is a convenient one. I didn't have time to go into the details. I don't think it's a particularly good one. We have a lot of measurement limitations still. Culture-based methods have short-term sampling problems and are of limited scope. Microscopy is expensive. We can't capture the temporality. The fluorescent methods lack specificity. There's no perfect answer to this problem. It's a challenge. And the system that we're interested in has three complex elements independently, and we're trying to understand the nexus of those three complex elements. So the opportunities, let's pursue further infusion of indoor environmental sciences with the rapidly evolving, evolving tools and knowledge from microbiology. Let's strive for generalizability. We're never going to measure everything, so let's think carefully about how what we measure might be generally true, not just particularly true. And I'm an emissions guy. I really want to know more about quantitative emissions, which we can't do theoretically. We have to do measurements to get that. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for a great presentation that put biological particles in the context of ventilation, emissions, depositions, human occupancy, as well as hearing about your mechanistic and quantitative insights into biological particles.